problem. Welcome, everyone. So I'm, I'm going to talk about foreign packages in, the, in GNU Geeks. And this is a talk I prepared together with David Thompson, who couldn't make it this time. So what, what is GNU Geeks to me? You know, you've heard of a lot of people by now. And for me, there's a holy grail. You know, I'm a software developer, and I want a controlled environment. Right? I want it to be predictable. Which means that I want to control the full dependency graph. Yeah, and to explain this is that when you write a piece of software and you give it to someone else and he files a bug, he says, you know, something is wrong with, your, with, with what you've written. And I have to ask him, you know, what distribution are you using it on? You know, what package manager did you use? Um, what, you know, if it's a Ruby gem, what, what gem version did you use? What Ruby did you use? What gems did you install, right? It's impossible. Yeah, so the holy grail is that you, you, know, you write a, a piece of software once with all its dependencies and you can reproduce it at any time. Yeah, so I can reproduce it on somebody else's machine. Exactly the environment that I'm using to run this software myself. It's a holy grail. I mean, how many of you are developing software? Right, so you know about this problem. The other thing which is really important uh, is that I want to understand what is happening even on my system. Right? So what are foreign packages? Really, non-native geeks packages we call them. You know, like Perl as uh, CPAN, Python packages which are, have been a straight nightmare for, for, from the start. Ruby gems, which did all right for a while, but if you're doing Ruby development, you know that it's not all that rosy now. R has its own system. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but actually, Emacs has its own packaging system. Firefox has one, right? So any tool that wants to install software locally is a foreign package manager. So there's a lot of them, yeah? And actually, a lot of these solutions are written because the underlying distribution, software distribution, doesn't do the job for them, right? So for Firefox, if you want to install a plugin, you know, they could have used Debian. But they didn't. So Ruby Jams, I'm going to treat especially as an example because I'm very familiar with it, and I, I, I wrote the implementation together with David for uh, for Geeks. Um, <coughs> so so what does a Ruby Jam actually do? Yeah, the Jam tool. If you say Jam install um, package, yeah, it does it by default in the globe, somewhere in the global system, somewhere in user local, whatever which is not the desired behavior unless you're a system administrator and you want to de you know, uh, <coughs> share it with other people. Alternate, the alternative is to define an environment variable called gem home, or pass it on the command line, um, which will you know, put it into a local directory. And the same for Python, the same for um, R and all that. They have this system. And there are some issues with that. Yeah, uh, for example, gems are based on major number versioning of Ruby. Right, so if you, if you have a Ruby 2.0 installed in your system, 2.0.1, um, the gems will be installed in a pass, something like, um, you know, with, this, with, a, with a version extended, but it's, it's capped at 2.0. Right, so if you, if, if you upgrade your Ruby, you know, to 2.02, you know, the, set, the gems will be installed in exactly the same directory. directory. So the underlying Ruby can be different, but you're sharing the gems, okay? And you see this solution in a lot of systems, including Python's. And why is this? I honestly don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a convenience. <laughs> it's a convenience for the Ruby developers. Yeah, they think that if, you, you know, if, they, have, if they don't have a, uh, a major number upgrade, that you can actually share the gems without problems. That's what they think, but there's no guarantee. So gems are not isolated, not even between Ruby's versions. And what has happened is that there's a whole stack of tools that have been built on top of Ruby, which, which tries to deal with this. So we have Ruby VM, RVM, which actually you know, overrides gem home and installs packages. It installs actually Ruby itself locally, yeah, so in your home directory, and then the whole tool stack on top of that. 
Yeah, so RBM, RVM tries to isolate Ruby. That's what it does. Yeah, so it tries to help. Um, RBM is a similar solution. And then Bundler is a, is a tool which actually um, starts from the source. So if you have a source tree, you run Bundler inside it and you say to Bundler, you know, I want for, my, for this particular source, I want to run this combination of gems. It will install them inside your source directory. As a developer, I got to dislike RVM and Bundler with a passion. Actually, I spend a lot of time fixing issues around RVM and Bundler, which I'm not supposed to be doing. You know, I was writing software. That's what, that was the fun of it. And Virtual Envin Python is a very similar solution to RVM and Bundler combined. So how do you solve this mess? Um, well, working on GNU Geeks, I realized that we could do something. So we, you know, we wanted to, to build support for Ruby inside GNU Geeks. Yeah, and, and so you support foreign packages. So we started simply with Gem Home, overriding Gem Home. Yeah, so that's what I realized. If you override Gem Home, you can isolate the gems for this particular Ruby. So you have Ruby in the store, right, in, in, in the GNU store. You installed it through GNU Geeks, so you got the GNU store, then the, uh, the hash value for this particular Ruby, and then the version and then Ruby minus V, and it will give you this one. So this is a nicely recent Ruby. That solves already one thing, because if I'm running Debian, I always end up with old Rubies. So what I do, basically, in my home directory, I, I, I override gem home, and I include the, this path, the Ruby store, and just force all the gems that I install for this Ruby, they are forced, really, in this directly, in, in my home path. And then I tell Ruby to use its gem path, right? So, so you need two variables. One is for install installing the packages, and one is for telling Ruby where to find it. And now I can do gem install, and it installs it in this directory, and I can run it. Works perfectly. And it's perfect isolation, because if I, if I change the Ruby, if I put another Ruby in the path, I can again override gem home and gem path, and they'll be completely isolated from each other. As a, as a software developer, this already is nirvana. Life got so much better. It works. <coughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm working with a reproducible modern Ruby for development. I have no need for RVM, RBN, for Butler, whatsoever. Gem works fine. Gems are isolated. Butler still works if you insist on using it. I don't. It works for me. But I'm not happy. And why is that? Because I've got two hats. I'm a programmer, but also I'm a system administrator. Yeah, and in the real world, uh, we need system-wide deployments. And they need to be reproducible also, right? And we want full control of the dependency graph, because what actually, what I did, I don't have full control of the dependency graph. Yeah, if I install two gems after each other under the same gem home, what actually happens? You know, and the order of installing gems also matters. So I, I'm tracking my own, my, my own time, so. Why did you do that? I'm also tracking your time. Ah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, 10 minutes left, good. So, you know, the, ultimately the point you derive at some, you know, you, you decide, okay, gems need to go into GNU Geeks, right? I can, I can, if I want to do system-wide deployments and I want to give it away and put it on servers, it's not going to work if I'll do this all in my home directory. So together with David, you know, I, we started adding Ruby gem support to Geeks. And it wasn't the first uh, support of a, of a foreign build system because Python was already in there, uh, R was already in there. So I'm going to skip the code walk itself, but it, there's actually four files involved. Um, one is called <coughs> Geeks Build System Ruby.scm, and it defines what a package should be like, right? So before, we've, in other talks, we've seen uh, package definitions, and most of them were around the GNU build system. So we have a Ruby build system now, yeah? And the Ruby build system has a certain layout for its package definition, which differs from the GNU build system, because we can override certain things that gems want or that Ruby wants. Yeah, so we've defined new variables uh, for our package definition, yeah? And that's contained in there. Yeah, so if you, if you put it something, if you put a value in your package definition which, is, which doesn't belong there, you will get an error. 
Yeah, so the different build systems have different definitions. Then you have got the Gigs build Ruby build system SCM. Yeah, and, and that actually does the unpacking and building of the gem in this case. Yeah, so it fetches a gem, um, it unpacks it, and it installs it. <coughs> and then we have Geeks import the Ruby the SEM, which actually gives you a Ruby package definition. It looks like this. <coughs> yeah, so Geeks has a native command called Geeks import gem, and then I add the gem name, right? And it will just on standard out spit this out. Okay? So this is actually the package definition itself. And you can see here that it has a build system named Ruby build system. And the downloaded version is a Ruby gem URI. So it actually fetches it directly from Ruby gems and it calculates the hash value of the downloaded package. Basically, you're done, right? You can just say gem, import it, boof, and then install it. It's, it's as easy, pretty much as easy as using gem install itself. Then there's a last file which is called GNU package ruby.scm. And this file actually, since it's in the GNU package directory, it contains the Ruby packages themselves. And there's a long list of them. I think there's over 100 packages now, 100 gems that have been put into, uh, into GNU Geeks. So where are we now? You can say geeks package minus i install ruby log for r. Yeah, so that same package definition that you saw here, we added to the, to the geeks tree, and now we can simply install it. And it installs its, the package into the store, so in slash new store, and then the hash value ruby log, log for r, and since it's a gem that only co uh, contains a lib, it adds a lib directory. Okay, and when somebody, you know, one user on your system types geeks package minus install ruby log for r, it will create also automatically the sim link. Yeah, so in, its, in the default geeks profile, lib ruby gems 2.2.0 gems, it will link to this library. Okay, and the, the geek store is immutable and it's versioned actually, you know, all, all the, all the Things that define the package ultimately result in this hash value. Is that yours or mine? <laughs> now it gets confusing. So we've got five minutes left. So now I need to tell Ruby, the Ruby that's running uh, uh, in your, your path, you know, where to find this gem. Yeah? And it actually, you just need to add this one, the gem path. And this gem path is, is actually suggested by Geeks itself. So if you say Geeks package, minus minus search paths, it will list you the paths that are relevant for the system and it includes the Ruby path with the gem path. So if you add this, Ruby from that point on knows how to find these gems. And I can just run it. Yeah, so Ruby minus E require log for R. Done. We have a fully reproducible Ruby. We have a fully reproducible gem. We can write it once and deploy it anywhere. For Python, it's pretty much the same story. Yeah, so you can list the Python packages. I think there's uh, 250 now in that order. Um, you can install a, a Python package. And for Python people, this is very important. Yeah, because Python eggs, setup, it's never worked that well. There are at least three package module managers. And when you do a Geeks import, like I did with Ruby, you know, it will, t it will give you a package definition straight from PyPy, you know, which is the package repository for Python. And really, Geeks will install anything as long as there's a setup.py in there. And I think it always works. Right, Ricardo? Works for me? Yeah, it always works. Yeah, so actually the Python people should be really happy now for the first time in history. <laughs> <laughs> There's something that consistently works. Yeah, but also, what is also great is that you know, we, uh, we can do a package definition, which is actually uh, easily um, scales to either Python 3 or Python 2. Yeah, so if you have a Python package defined, a Python module, you know, basically using this import, 
you add a line saying define public Python 2 part daytime, package with Python 2, so it, it uses the Python 2 interpreter 2.7, and then you say Python part daytime. Now you get two packages on your system. One is, one is the one that will install with Python 3, and the other one will install with Python 2. The first time I saw this, it basically blew my mind, but <laughs> I'm, I'm coming back. So R is a very similar story. You can import directly packages from CRAN, and you can also import them directly, thanks to Ricardo's work, from Bioconductor. And R is a bit of a success story in the sense that its package management has been pretty great. Yeah, and they put a lot of testing in there. Um, and people are really happy because when you, when you install R and you, and you use these packages in general, they just work. But there's one caveat. You know, R modules are tied with the release of R. Yeah, so if you have a certain version of a module, um, it actually belongs to a certain version of R. Now what happens when you, have, when you want to have different version of modules that actually require a different version of R? You go straight to hell. Yeah, and in, in, uh, in Geeks, R modules are not tied to R releases. They're independent of each other. So to recapture, two more minutes, really. <coughs> um, well, we've covered this. Quickly, the difference with Debian. Unlike Debian, versioning of packages is not a problem in Geeks. Multiple targets are not a problem. So if you have an Apache that you want to install with SSL or without SSL, you basically get two Apaches. And you can run them both at the same time. Yeah, same for Ruby. You can run R with BLAS uh, linked into it or Atlas. Yeah, you can just do that because everything is strictly isolated through the SHA value in the path. So foreign inputs, imports are easy. You can just, if you have a foreign input system and you, and you, and you write a build system to, for, to support that, you can quickly create these packages. The only dependency for Geeks itself at this point is the Linux kernel API. So Glipsy is actually not, you know, Glip, I mean, everything, Glipsy is in the graph, but you can actually have different versions of Glipsy running on your system and build, the, you know, the tooling on top of that. The only thing that you consistently need is, a, is a, to reproduce binary packages is a single kernel API. Fortunately, it doesn't change that quickly. What about Docker? With Docker, people may, may not realize, but the, you know, when you build a Docker image, the time and order of software installation matters. You get different outputs. Yeah, so the build of the Docker image itself is not reproducible, and you don't actually know what's in there un until you start looking. And why do you send multiple gigabytes of data around just for a simple thing, maintain, maintaining a package? Docker comes with file system and network policies. It's pretty crazy, you know? And at what level should we care about these things? I don't think we should care. Yeah, so this is for the Twitter sphere. You must be mad to use Docker when there's new gigs available. So, is GNU gigs available for anyone? Um, for yes. Docker is available? Yes. Yes, yes. I mean, I think it's still, sta is it alpha still? Be we're beta. <laughs> We, we, we've actually transitioned from alpha to beta. I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's on the website already. <coughs> and I think we will go very quickly to stable. And actually, um, GNU, Geeks has, GNU Geeks has support for um, containers also. Yeah, so you can actually, unlike a, a Docker container, which is several gigabytes, a GNU Geeks container can be as small as a few kilobytes. And you have the exact same functionality. Thank you.